This video was brought to you by Skillshare. On the 3rd of October 1990, 33 years ago, Germany reunified after decades of split between the East and West. Reunification was a massive political, economic and social task that still reverberates to this day, with a majority of Germans saying that the country remains more divided than united, and the East German states still lagging behind on a number of key metrics. So in this video, we're going to take a look at why this is by exploring the persistent East-West differences, explaining some of the root causes and taking a look at the reunification process itself. Before we start, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and ringing the bell to stay in the loop and be notified when we release new videos. So let's start by taking a look at exactly where Eastern Germany lags behind Western Germany. Beginning with GDP per capita, the five former East German states sit at the bottom of the table, with GDPs per capita between 32,000 and 36,000 euros, well below the German average of just under 46,000. In 2022, the average yearly salary in Eastern Germany was around 13,000 euros less than it was in the West. And in terms of the distribution of wealth, there's an even starker difference, with the median wealth of a household in Eastern Germany at 43,400 euros in 2021, compared to 127,900 in Western Germany. But that's not all. Unemployment has also been persistently higher in the East than the West, with the latest data from September 2023 showing Eastern Germany with an unemployment rate of 7.1% and Western Germany with 5.4%. The continued differences aren't limited to economics either. For example, looking into religion, specifically Christianity, the former border is still very clear due to the East government's promotion of atheism and hostility towards religion. East Germany is also notably older than Western Germany, reflecting the post-reunification exodus of young Germans from Eastern states to Western ones, and the collapse of the fertility rate in the East following reunification. With all of this in mind, particularly on the economic front, it might not be surprising to see a significant proportion of Germans still seeing their country as pretty divided. In fact, a study from early this year found that 60% of Germans think that their country is more divided than united. And that pessimism is even more stark in Eastern Germany, where 75% feel that the divisions still prevail. Now, to understand these persistent divisions, we're going to have to go back to the late 1980s and early 1990s, around the time of German reunification. Unsurprisingly, the political and economic systems of the two Germanys were incredibly different. West Germany, officially the Federal Republic of Germany, was a capitalist country firmly within the Western alliance and part of the European Economic Community. Meanwhile, East Germany, officially the German Democratic Republic, was a socialist country within the Soviet Union's sphere of influence. As you can probably imagine, reunifying these two systems was never going to be a simple task. West Germany had experienced a post-war economic miracle and had grown into one of Europe's most developed countries, with its productivity far outstripping its eastern counterpart by the time of reunification. Now, this reunification process didn't actually see the two states dissolve and emerge as a new third state with some sort of hybrid system. Rather, what actually happened was the dissolution of East Germany and its subsequent absorption by West Germany. That's because one of the major features of reunification was the mass privatization of East German companies, rapidly carried out by a government agency called the Treihandenstaat. By the end of its operations in 1994, it had overseen the restructuring, sale, or liquidation of thousands and thousands of previously state-owned enterprises, covering some 4 million jobs. This brought about significant economic turmoil in eastern Germany, as many of these enterprises found themselves unable to successfully compete in the free market that they'd been thrust into. And even the most productive Eastern German enterprises were typically bought up by investors and companies from Western Germany, who had better access to financial capital. 
Now, Eastern German businesses struggled for a few reasons, not least because of the rapid introduction of the West German Deutschmark as the official currency of East Germany in July 1990, which quickly pushed up Eastern German wages and therefore business costs. But also because consumers in the East were shifting towards spending more money on Western-made products, while Eastern businesses lost their traditional markets in the Eastern Bloc. As a result of all of this, the industrial output of the East plummeted, and there was a sharp rise in unemployment. In fact, the Eastern German economy lost some 2.5 million jobs in the three years between 1989 and 1992, and the period was also marked by an exodus of largely working-age Germans moving from the east of the country to the west, seeking jobs, higher living standards, and more. In fact, between 1990, the year of reunification, and 2016, the eastern states lost 1.2 million people to the western states. Ultimately, it's hard to overstate the turbulence that eastern Germany experienced in the reunification period. As Angela Merkel, herself a former East German citizen, reflected on in 2021, too little attention has been given to the fact that for the vast majority of people in the West, reunification meant that things continued as they had before. While for us East Germans, almost everything changed. Politics, the workplace, and society. Now, it's worth quickly noting that these persistent economic differences that we described earlier are meant to imply that Western Germany is a shiny utopia, while the Eastern states are a wasteland. That's because there's significant variation between the regions themselves, and inequality is obviously not just limited to an East-West axis. In fact, the German government's commissioner for East Germany this year said that the differences between urban and rural areas across Germany were often more stark than the differences between Eastern and Western Germany. Nevertheless, in the three decades since reunification, the government has injected some $2 trillion into Eastern Germany in the forms of things like social benefits, infrastructure upgrades, and more. And to be fair, a lot of progress has been made in closing the East-West gap. Wages, disposable income, living standards, and productivity all rose pretty rapidly in the first few years, and have continued to rise, albeit at a slower pace, over the following decades. In fact, the net migration of people from east to west ended in the mid-2010s, and there's actually been some movement back the other way. Additionally, in the last few years, there's been a shift in Germany's industrial geography, with Chancellor Olaf Scholz declaring in 2022 that Eastern Germany is now one of the most attractive economic regions in Europe. Tesla's first European manufacturing site was opened in 2022 in Brandenburg, and Saxony has been dubbed Silicon Saxony due to its growth as a semiconductor hub with one in three microchips being produced in Europe coming from the state, which host companies including Infineon, Bosch, Xfab, and Global Foundries. Meanwhile, US tech giant Intel is planning on building a multi-billion euro microchip plant in Magdeburg. But all of this has come as perceptions of German unity have gotten worse over the past few years. So evidently, there is more work to be done, not just on the economic front, but also socially and culturally too. In fact, if you want to learn more about divides across Europe, a year or so ago, we surveyed our audience to learn more about the East-West split on the continent as a whole. That video, including the data on where that split really lies, which countries are Eastern and which are Western, can be found linked in the description. A few weeks ago, we told you that we were making a physical newspaper. But it turns out that designing a newspaper isn't all that easy. So we headed to Skillshare to take their course on the topic. And unlike when I tried to learn InDesign for another never-released project a few years ago, this time I was guided through the process quickly and efficiently. And this time, the project will actually see the light of day thanks to Skillshare's incredibly easy-to-follow guides. In fact, here's an exclusive little preview of what we've been working on. It's not just that either. You likely already know that Skillshare have classes for things like photography, editing, and illustration. But Skillshare also have hundreds of career-focused classes too. That's courses on everything from how to start a business, to maximizing your workflow, or how to grow in e-commerce. Another course that I'm taking to help with the newspaper. And if you use our link in the description, you'll get access to all of that for free. 
That's right, the first 500 people to use our link will get access to one of Skillshare's best offers, a 30-day free trial and 40% of your first year of Skillshare membership. As I say, that's the best Skillshare offer that we've ever had. So make sure that you click our link in the description. Thanks for your support and thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video.